All right. <clears throat> so thank you again for joining us. My name is Liz. I work with the Xerces Society, and we're presenting this course today in partnership with the Kitsap and Jefferson Conservation Districts up in Washington. Um, we have Sharon Ye and Diane Fish with us, and I'll let them introduce themselves shortly. And our presenter today is my coworker, Eric Lee Motter. He's the Pollinator Conservation and Ag Biodiversity Program Co-Director at Xerces as well. And with that, I will send it on over to Diane. Good afternoon, everybody. We are so excited that you're able to join us today. Um, my name is Diane Fish. I'm a resource planner at the Kitsap Conservation District. I also coordinate their Grace Garden Project, which uh, is a food bank farm. And this year we received funding to do a invest in pollinators, native pollinators. And so part of our funding is what is bringing you this webinar today. And so we're really excited to have you. Um, just as a brief plug, we're getting ready to open up for our native plant sale on the 14th of December. And so um, and if any of you are interested in buying Eric's um, native pollinator seed mix, we will have some of that available. If you go to our website listed there on the district webpage, you can find it in our tree sale offerings. And um, again, we're excited to have you with us today and thank you for joining us. Hello everybody, this is Sharon Ye speaking. I'm the conservation planner at Jefferson County Conservation District. And we're just very excited as well to offer this uh, new partnership to us. And if you are in Jefferson County and would like to see more presentations like this or on other topics, um, please let us know. We're always open to more feedback and looking to enhance our services um, to the local community. Um, we just appreciate you for dialing in and um, let us know if you have any interest. Thanks so much. Thank you, Diane and Sharon. I, I guess I will pick it up from here. Um, this is Eric. I am, as Liz mentioned, the Pollinator Conservation Program Director at Xerces. Um, we have a co-director model within our program. I focus on our private sector partnerships primarily and technical support to, to food companies, primarily in the organic and natural food space and uh, direct support for farmers and, and several uh, sustainable energy initiatives and a few other things at Xerces. Just for, um, I guess, a, a couple of additional reference points, I'm based up here in Fort Townsend, Washington, uh, land of the penny saver market and CJ's fish and chips and extra tough boots. Um, but I actually have a farm over on Whidbey Island with a established um, seed business that Diane was, was nice enough to, <laughs> to put in a plug for, although it was totally unnecessary. Um, so I have an established seed business in addition to the work I do at Xerces and, and a newer, um, not yet bearing cider apple orchard, which has been built around um, kind of a, an alley cropping and agroforestry model. So I come at my work from both a day-to-day uh, professional role in wildlife conservation, as well as kind of a, a practical role on the farming side of things as well. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar or, or totally familiar with the Xerces Society, the Xerces Society is now in two months, it will officially be a 50 year old wildlife conservation nonprofit named after the now extinct Xerces blue butterfly, which was the first butterfly to go extinct in North America as a result of habitat loss. And the organization really began as a butterfly conservation group founded by a, a lepidopterist, a butterfly researcher named Bob Pyle. Uh, the organization over the years has really expanded our focus to work not just on butterflies, but on a whole range of invertebrate animal groups. 
so today we have people working still on butterflies, but also on other animals as diverse as freshwater mussels and fireflies. We have people working on endangered species protection. We have people working on pesticide policy and, and uh, regulatory issues. We have people working on aquatic conservation initiatives. The program that I am housed within is our pollinator and ag biodiversity program, which is mostly focused on creating habitats and pesticide protections for wild bees and beneficial insects in working agricultural lands. And it's worth also here to set the stage to just reflect on why we do the work that we do at Xerces. Within the wildlife conservation community, working on insects and invertebrates is, is sort of an uncommon thing. And yet, if you consider the fact that not only are these things the pollinators that we're here to talk about today, but that invertebrate animals play a critical role in things like uh, soil production and, and organic matter uh, recycling. These are animals that are oftentimes the primary food source for other wildlife as diverse as juvenile salmon or songbirds. They are essentially the, the linchpin that hold together a lot of terrestrial and aquatic uh, communities. And of course, these are the most abundant and diverse living organisms on Earth. Earth is truly a planet made up of insects and invertebrate animals, and we are um, in many ways here simply as their guests. Uh, this, this is a, a pretty interesting graph that I hope puts that in perspective. You can see the small sliver of life on Earth that we as mammals occupy. Uh, I'll also, just to help frame the conversation here, you know, we will be talking mostly about farms today, and it's also relatively uncommon in the wildlife conservation space to be focused as closely on agriculture as my program is. But because agriculture is the single largest land use on the planet and agriculture disproportionately impacts wildlife, from a strategic standpoint, this is the area that I, I have mostly focused my career on and that my team focuses their work on as well. Agriculture truly is essential to the, the biodiversity of the planet today. The work that we do within our program oftentimes looks like this. It's work to reintegrate wild habitat, native plant habitat primarily back into agricultural systems. This is a 2000 acre almond orchard in the Central Valley of California here on the screen with these native California wildflowers that have been planted on field border areas throughout this, this system. Similarly, we work on, on crops as diverse as small grains in the, in the Great Plains. We work on dairy farms in New England. Uh, this is a blueberry farm here on screen in the Willamette Valley of Oregon. And this is a manifestation of the, the type of work that we do, of going in and integrating wildflower habitat in and around these crops. In this case, this entire blueberry farm is pollinated by the wild bees that are sustained by these flowering field borders. They don't need to bring in honeybees to pollinate those, those crops. Pollinators, um, and I'll spend some time here talking about sort of what pollinators are. And as we go through the, the 90 minutes here, we'll talk more about everything from uh, the the types of pollinators and beneficial insects that you might find on regional farms to how we restore habitat for them. But to, to sort of continue to frame the conversation here, um, I'll just point out that the majority of, of upland or terrestrial plant species on the planet require pollinators or heavily depend upon pollinators to help fertilize those plants and produce seeds and carry on the reproduction of those species. We can put all sorts of clever statistics on 
um, uh, on the value of pollinators, we can say you know that they contribute one out of every three uh, bites of food or drink that we consume, that their value is worth billions of dollars a year to the US economy. From my perspective, trying to put a dollar value on these things is sort of like trying to put a dollar value on clean water or on oxygen. We really don't have a substitute for the, the service that these animals provide. And when we talk about pollinators, we are, of course, talking about this huge range of different types of animals, from butterflies and moths to various beetles to certain flies, uh, hummingbirds, bats in some parts of the world, lemurs in other parts of the world. Of all of these different groups of pollinators, bees are, are arguably the most important. And that's because bees are built specifically to carry large volumes of pollen uh, back to their nests. So with very few exceptions, bees are the, are the primary or main group of animals on earth that feed primarily on pollen during their juvenile stage. And so bees have evolved these hairy bodies with uh, a weak static electric charge to help stick pollen to their pollen grains to their uh, to their bodies and fly it back to the nest where they feed it to their young. And in the process of transporting huge amounts of pollen, they drop pollen grains everywhere they grow, everywhere they go. So they're constantly moving pollen from flower to flower to flower. Um, and I'll point out that you know bees undergo this dietary transition over the course of their life where they're feeding on pollen, which is a protein rich uh, food source during their larval stage when they're growing their bodies. And then they become adults and they switch to a carbohydrate based diet of, of flower nectar. Um, a couple of the things that make bees really important as pollinators are um, number one, a foraging behavior called floral constancy, meaning that a bee visiting a blueberry flower is going to go from blueberry flower to blueberry flower to blueberry flower in a, a relatively confined span of time. They're not going to go from a blueberry flower to an apple blossom or to a clover flower. And so their fidelity to one species of flower over a given period of time is what benefits us in terms of the cross-pollination of those plants. And the last thing is that bees are also place-based. Unlike a butterfly that's simply fluttering across the landscape and doesn't have a home, bees are building a nest and provisioning that nest for their offspring. So that allows us to, in the case of keeping honeybees, we can go put a, a honeybee hive out in an orchard and expect the service of pollination to radiate out from that honeybee hive. Or we can do what, what we do at Xerxes, which is to build habitat for these wild bees to, to live in. And then the service of pollination will radiate out from that habitat. And I'll talk more about that here uh, in a few minutes. I think it's worth also here at the beginning to reflect on the status of pollinators and by extension, the status of insects on, on planet today. Um, so we know, of course, if, if we've been paying attention to the media that bees have gotten a huge amount of attention for the struggles they've faced over the past uh, decade and a half. Uh, more comprehensively, there's a lot of discussion around the widespread loss and disappearance of insects across the planet. Uh, there's an article in the New York Times here a couple of years ago that that's some of the seen around the insect apocalypse. To um, I guess dial in what that that insect decline looks like, we could start with the example of honeybees. And honeybees, I will point out, are not native to North America. They were in, first imported in the 1600s, uh, but they did relatively well in North America for several hundred years. Um, the honeybee industry has, 
obviously seen its ups and downs over those centuries, but the past uh, 60 or 70 years has been particularly tricky. So going back to the mid part of the last century, we had roughly twice as many managed honey beehives in the United States as we have today. There's a whole range of factors contributing to the loss of honeybees, um, par parasites like the varroa mite, that's the black disc on the back of this honeybee, uh, which is a, a parasite of Asian honeybees. This was accidentally introduced in the, in the 1980s. It's a parasite that obviously is huge in scale compared to the honeybee and one that also sucks fluids out of the, the bee and vectors viruses. Uh, but along with parasites, honeybees have certainly suffered from pesticide use, they've suffered from habitat loss, and this decline in honeybees is having a real world economic impact on, on U.S. agriculture. And the place that we can see that most clearly is in the case of the almond industry in California. Now this, I have tried to not include too many boring looking graphs in the, in the presentation here today. But if you can bear with me here for a moment, you can see this graph represents the average cost to rent a honeybee colony in California for almond pollination over the span of about a decade. If you look at the mid 90s, almond growers were paying an average of around 35 or $40 to rent a single honeybee hive. By 2005, that number had just about doubled as honeybee hive, commercial honeybee hive numbers had dropped off uh, across the United States. So there began to be this, this diminishing supply of commercial honeybee hives. For reference, there are about 900,000 acres of almonds in California. Those almond orchards are stocked at uh, usually a minimum rate of two honeybee hives per acre. On a good day, there's probably two million commercial honeybee hives in the United States. Um, so it's, it's not an industry with a lot of surplus bees available. Well, 2006 came along and suddenly the media introduced in the public consciousness this term called colony collapse disorder. And suddenly people were talking about the fact that beekeepers were losing huge numbers of hives. You had some beekeepers losing essentially all of their hives and a few beekeepers going out of business in that time frame. 2007 came along, 2008, and the years did not get better. And I don't know if you can see this on your screen, uh, but here on the right hand side, by 2008, almond growers in California were, were paying an average of $200 to rent a single honeybee hive for the brief period in which almond trees are in bloom. So this is a, a curve that has leveled off a little bit, but it's not going to go back down. Beyond honeybees, we see arguably even more significant and alarming declines in some of our, our native pollinators. And two examples of this would be our bumblebees and monarch butterflies. We have 50 odd species of bumblebees in North America. As of today, roughly a quarter of them are at risk of extinction. Several of them are probably already likely extinct. Um, we have a even more significant decline that we're experiencing with monarch butterflies, um, particularly in the West where there's a separate population that overwinters on the California coast and migrates to the inland Northwest every summer. That Western population in particular is one that could be teetering on the brink of total collapse at this point. We, are hovering around a population level with it that is, is oftentimes described as, as something akin to a extinction threshold. Um, and that, again, these numbers are not going to probably rebound in the near term here, but with some really robust and active conservation, we, we can hopefully turn the tide at some point. These declines that we're seeing with 
monarchs, with honeybees, with bumblebees are in fact representative of sort of a larger overarching trend of insect declines. Uh, the, the research is continuing to show bigger and bigger uh, reference points where in the case of this study in Germany looking at nature preserves, which by definition should preserve nature, the, the researchers there found that um, since the, the mid 80s, these nature preserves had more than a 75% decline in just the sheer biomass of insects present in them. And if we, if we zoom out beyond just insects and invertebrates, we see that these similar trends are playing out with wildlife in general, whether we're talking about large mammals or amphibians or songbirds or fish. Uh, the best uh, tool that we have for examining and really synthesizing what's going on with wildlife populations at a global level is a tool called the Living Planet Index, which is a product of the World Wildlife Federation and the London Zoological Society. It uses this big data uh, approach of aggregating population surveys for thousands of different animals and monitoring the trends of those populations over multiple decades. And what we've seen is that over the past 40 years, Earth has lost approximately 60% of the sheer numbers of wild animals that used to roam its surface or swim in its waters. Now, there's lots of factors contributing to the decline of wildlife and insects. I mentioned earlier many of these, but we continue to see uh, increases in certain kinds of insecticides. One group that has gotten a lot of attention in recent years is a group called the neonicotinoids. These are uh, synthetic nicotine-like compounds that are absorbed into plant tissue and sometimes released in flower nectar or pollen and can uh, contribute to uh, pollinator losses with either lethal exposure or what we call sublethal exposure, where maybe a bee visiting a, a contaminated flower may not die, but it may have reduced reproduction, it may have reduced cognition. Um, so the, the populations begin to, to dwindle or suffer. And these neonicotinoids are now the most abundant and widespread use of insecticides on, on Earth today with roughly more than half of all surface waters in the United States having measurable levels of these insecticides present. We also continue to see large scale habitat loss, both from urbanization as well as from conversion of, uh, of permanent natural areas, particularly grasslands in the central US to agriculture. And this has only been accelerated in recent years with things like a, a, a renewed policy emphasis on biofuels um, such as ethanol, which have incentivized more. Uh, crop production. So that's essentially where we are with our pollinators and uh, wildlife at the moment. I want to take a few minutes here and talk a little bit more about what the, the ecology and life history of the pollinators in our region consists of. And then, you know, we'll, after that, I'll, I'll dive into a little bit more of the conservation nuts and bolts and how we apply our understanding of pollinator ecology to their conservation on farms and, uh, and gardens as well and, and other types of uh, the human landscape. So there are roughly 3,500 or 4,000 species of native bees in North America. And this group is incredibly diverse. There are only a handful of people that can take every single wild bee specimen and look at it under a microscope and identify it down to species level. The group, uh, the, the group of wild bees that we have is so diverse and so widespread. Um, but these are animals that have 
co-evolved in our continent with the native plants of our continent, whether those are our wild flowering plants or crop plants that we grow commercially today, like sunflower or squash or cranberries. Of all of these different groups, rather than trying to communicate what specific species or individuals might be, I'd rather focus on three functional groups. And if you can remember that there are these three functional groups of native bees, you can, you can do a tremendous amount of conservation based just on that knowledge of these three groups. So the first of these functional groups of native bees is our bumblebees. And these are the classic social bees that we oftentimes think of that, that live in a complex family unit with a queen, with her worker daughters, with drones, which are the male bees. Uh, in many ways, bumblebees parallel honeybees in their life history with the big distinction that honeybees are a perennial organism, much like a perennial plant. In a theoretical absence of parasites or diseases or pesticides, a honeybee colony in perfect health could live forever simply by replacing the queen when, when the old queen begins to lose her reproductive potential. Um, bumblebees are much more, bumblebees are more like an annual plant to stick with that comparison where they're planted, a bumblebee colony is planted by seed every single year. And I'll show you a, a typical life cycle that will illustrate this in more detail here in a moment. But bumblebees in these family units are usually living in the ground. They're usually living in old abandoned rodent burrows or underneath thatchy vegetation. Sometimes they'll nest in buildings or hay bales or things like that. And these are animals that are really well built for our environment. We have got a remarkably um, diverse community of bumblebees in this part of North America. The, with these large, hairy, robust bodies, they're built for cold, wet, rainy conditions. Um, and as I mentioned, these are animals that are usually living in old abandoned rodent burrows or, or messy areas in the landscape. If you can see this illustration here on screen, this shows what a typical bumblebee life cycle consists of. So right now, if you look out your window, the only bumblebees that are out there in that landscape right now are the new queens, the queens that were hatched this past spring or summer, which have now dug themselves down into the ground and they are hibernating for the winter. And they may only be down a few inches in the soil or in the leaf litter. In the springtime, at about the three o'clock position here on this illustration, those queens are gonna emerge from the ground and they're gonna look for a suitable nest cavity about this big, um, if you're looking at me on the screen, about the, the diameter of a, a football or a basketball. And they might be um, initially out collecting some pollen and some nectar and storing that little bit of nectar in a little tiny uh, wax uh, pot in their, in their hive. And then very shortly after finding that nest, the queen is gonna begin to lay eggs and she will uh, oftentimes sit on top of those eggs, like a songbird will sit on top of their eggs and she will incubate those eggs with her body. Bumblebees can actually raise their body temperature. Once those eggs hatch at about the six o'clock position in this illustration, those are the initial worker daughters and they're gonna take over all of the duties of going out and bringing back more pollen and more nectar to feed more um, larval offspring of the queen. Those workers are the ones that are going to come out and sting you when you run your lawnmower over their nest. And then by midsummer in Northwest Washington, the, that colony will begin to decline and the 
old queen will begin to lay um, male eggs and bees can decide if they're gonna lay male or female eggs. So she'll begin to lay male eggs, which are the drones, the male bees. Um, the colony, if it's successful at bringing back enough food, they'll also be able to raise larger and, and heavier and more fully developed females, some of whom will have fully developed reproductive systems and those will be the new queens. And at the nine o'clock position here in your illustration, those, old, those new queens and the drones will fly out of the hive, they'll find mates. Um, the female, not to get too graphic here, will store the sperm from that mating event in an organ called the spermatheca. And the male bees, the drones, will all die late in the season. The old queen will die late in the season. All of the workers from the old colony die. The new queens that have mated are the only bumblebees that will survive a, a single year and go on to start a new colony in the following year. The next functional group of native bees are, are ground nesting bees. And these are the most diverse bees, not only in our region, but in North America and on Earth. The majority of bees on planet Earth live the, in exactly the way that I'm about to describe to you, which is that each single female ground nesting bee species excavates and establishes her own nest. Um, they don't live in a complex family unit typically. These nests might extend down several feet into the soil. Oftentimes they're lined with waxy glandular secretions that can reduce flooding. And these female bees will go out and they may only be active as adults for a few weeks out of the year. They'll go out and collect pollen and bring it back down and store it in cells at the base of these tunnels in the ground and lay eggs on these, on these pollen masses. So here you can see at the top, the female bees out there foraging and collecting pollen. She brings that pollen back and stores it in these underground cells. She'll lay an egg on it there at the six o'clock position. At the seven o'clock position, that egg will hatch. The larvae will feed on that protein-rich pollen food source. Uh, there at about the nine o'clock position, the, the larva will pupate. It will undergo complete metamorphosis and the bee will emerge typically the following year as a, a new fully developed bee. The males have no role in, in this life cycle other than mating with the females when they emerge in the spring. Uh, the, the females, again, are, are typically doing all of this work on their own and their reproductive rate is actually pretty small. It's uh, a single ground nesting bee might only lay 20 eggs in the course of her life. Um, so it's remarkable that the that the majority of all bee species on earth live exactly this way and that this group has been as successful as it has been. Here in Washington, you'll see things like green sweat bees on the left or longhorn bees on the right. These are common ground nesting bees in our region. Um, you'll see these oftentimes on spring. You'll see ground nesting bees on spring flowering plants and then again on our midsummer uh, flowering plants, things like sunflowers or cosmos in your garden. The last functional group here of native bees are, are wood nesting bees. And these include things like mason bees and leaf cutter bees. Leaf cutter bees here get the name uh, for the fact that they cut out these circular pieces of leaf sections and they bring these back to their nest and actually will provision pollen inside the nest and lay an egg on the pollen and they'll wrap that whole mass with sort of a, a leaf uh, package around it. And then they'll use these leaf pieces to also cover up the entrances to, uh, to their nest tunnels in wood. And for the most part, they're not excavating these nests. They tend to use old woodpecker holes or beetle borer holes or the hollow pithy stems of things like reeds or blackberry canes. Uh, again, the, the life cycle here is pretty similar to 
other bee species like the ground nesting bees, you can see in this top cross section of a hollow plant stem, this mason bee has gone in and, and provisioned each of these cells with a mass of pollen. She's laid an egg on those pollen masses, and then she separates or partitions each of these developing offspring with a little mud wall, hence the name mason bees. They're, they're little brick masons building these masonry walls. And then in the springtime, these bees will, after undergoing complete metamorphosis, will emerge and they'll, they'll trickle out of the entrance of these nests one by one. If you're looking at the lower photo here, you might notice that the cocoons on the right-hand side the, are smaller and they're nearer the entrance. Those are male bee cocoons. And bees being incredibly smart, well-adapted animals know to lay the male eggs nearest the entrance so that a woodpecker or earwig or predatory wasp that is able to break open the entrance and get inside will consume the male offspring and leave the females uh, deeper within the nest more, more fully protected. So that, that in a nutshell, a big nutshell, is sort of the, the broad uh, diversity of wild bees that you'll find in our region. And I'll get to how you apply the principles of understanding their life history to conservation here in a moment. Um, let's also not forget, though, that we are also home to a number of, of at-risk pollinators. So within Northwest Washington, we have things like the Western bumblebee, Bombus occidentalis, which we know to be a a rapidly declining species. It used to be the most abundant bumblebee in our region, and now it's, it's potentially one of the rarest in our, uh, at least in lowland areas in the Northwest. We also have these rare and declining butterflies, things like the Taylor's checker spot, uh, the Marden skipper. Uh, the island marble is a, a butterfly that has one remaining tiny remnant population out on San Juan Island and is probably one winter king tide storm away from extinction at this point. So let's switch gears here and um i think at this point it's probably clear that i'm i'm not going to talk about honeybees or beekeeping in this webinar the focus of my work again is really on the conservation of these wild bees and it turns out that these wild bees have an incredible value to u.s agriculture to to garden plants to wild ecosystems and we know that if we are able to preserve and protect habitat for them in agricultural landscapes, that these bees can contribute a lot to crop production. Initially, when we started our work on wild bees, we focused on the Central Valley of California, one of the most intensively farmed landscapes on Earth. And with the, the assistance of some research partners there, it quickly became clear that um, most farms in the Central Valley of California are, are experiencing pollinator deficits and need to bring in honeybees to pollinate their crops. But if you move outside of the core of the Central Valley and move out into mountain foothills or the edges of the valley where there's some shrubby riparian areas and hedgerows, that those farms that have more than 30% of their surrounding landscape in natural habitat can get all of their crop pollination needs met from that habitat alone. It turns out that this, uh, this principle was also ground truth in other cropping systems and in other parts of the world. So researchers in Canada discovered that canola, which is a, a plant that strongly benefits from insect pollination, uh, that canola growers in the prairie provinces of Canada actually had greater yields and hence more profitable farms if they left 30% of their farm out of production as habitat for wild pollinators. And this is what that looks like 
in concept. So on the left-hand side, you have this fence row to fence row canola production. If you switch over here to the right side and take some of that land out of production, this farm system on the right actually produces more canola. It has higher yields than the model on the left, which is counterintuitive. But this is because the, the addition of wild pollinators supported by this habitat increases the seed set and overall, overall yields of canola in this system on the right. Beyond pollinators, these same habitat systems support things like uh, ground beetles that play a valuable and widely under-recognized role in the consumption of weed seeds. And remarkably, a lot of our ground beetles preferentially feed on weedy plants, um, the seeds of things like, like pigweed or crabgrass, and a single ground beetle may consume hundreds of seeds in a 24-hour period. These same habitat principles also, also support things like dung beetles, which are valuable for cycling nutrients in farmlands and uh, actually have a globally significant role in methane reduction and, and a, a role to play in helping to mitigate climate change. These same habitat systems also support uh, beneficial songbirds. And we know that in crops like alfalfa production, that songbirds can contribute more than 30% of the, the necessary pest suppression for profitable crop production. Um, songbirds alone, but they, they're really dependent upon habitat adjacent to those croplands. Um, again, sticking with bees here for a moment, again, um, looking at Michigan, our, our partners there at Michigan State University were able to show that planting wildflowers adjacent to blueberry crops resulted in double digit yield increases in those crops. And of course, there's a, a economic cost to installing wildflowers around a, a farm. But the researchers were able to tease out that um, the economics are such that you typically get a return on investment in three to four years from planting those habitat areas. And of course, you're also supporting all of these other beneficial insects, things like lace wings and assassin bugs and surfid flies. And we know that when uh, more than 20% of a farm is in some kind of diverse wildlife habitat that there are measurable levels of this, this natural pest suppression that can be tracked throughout crop fields, a service that's worth billions of dollars a year to U.S. agriculture. Um, fundamentally, we all recognize that to make these things happen, to have songbirds, to have dung beetles, to have pollinators, to have beneficial insects on a farm, farms need to have those wild areas. They can't simply be monocultures. If you've got a monoculture of any crop, the insects that can survive in that monoculture are the insects that feed on that monoculture. All of the other beneficial organisms depend upon um, alternate food sources, when their prey are not available, or when flowering plants are not available, they depend upon these other spaces to lay eggs, other spaces to, to spend the winter. Uh, all of these beneficial insects need more. So to conclude this section, I will just point out that none of this is new or novel thinking, and none of this is my thinking, none of this was invented by us at Xerxes. This is agriculture as, as people once understood it, where uh, we have a tradition in this country of our US Department of Agriculture producing publications like this called Making Land Produce Useful Wildlife. I think this particular publication first came out in the 19, early 1940s and then was reprinted a few times. Um, we had states like the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture producing uh, whole books on things like useful birds and their protection, which had sections on how birds would save crops from pest outbreaks. 
Uh, here you go, Birds Save Trees and Crops from, from Pests. It's an excerpt from this book. And at one point in this country's history during the Second World War, it was recognized that these animals were so important to agriculture that it was your patriotic duty to protect them. And here's a, a magazine advertisement by the Federal Cartridge Corporation, which was probably making good money in, in the Second World War, um, telling people to go out and feed the birds, that it was, your, it was part of your, your national duty to do so. Um, is an excerpt from a fact sheet that came out of Iowa in the, the 1950s that made the, the bold statement that wild bees are good pollinators and told you that you could uh, protect things like, like fence row um, brush and woodlots and uh, field border areas on your farm and that these living fences or hedgerows would support the wild bumblebees that could come out and pollinate your crop. At one point, the USDA even produced this fine publication. This is one of my favorites, The Economic Value of North American Skunks. <clears throat> and it pointed out that the skunk has now become a recognized <laughs> asset in the communities it inhabits and that the skunk conserves the food supply by preying upon uh, insects and other pests of crops. It would be great if we again had a U.S. Department of Agriculture that recognized the, the ecological role that skunks play in our food system. Okay, I think now at this point I'm going to totally switch course and really focus on farming principles rather than wildlife or pollinator ecology or life history. And to, um, to start this off, I'll point out that um, a lot of my thinking at Xerces and the work that I do has been informed by these really old agricultural models. Um, there's a great book from 1911 by Frank Hiram King, who was among other things, the the original designer or inventor of the grain silo. And in the last couple of years of his life, uh, King traveled to Asia, to China, Korea, and Japan to tour the, the farming systems of those nations. And he was obsessed with this question of how the how individual plots of land in these countries had been farmed productively for hundreds of years. And King had risen up through um, agricultural science in the United States as a early pioneer in soil science and soil chemistry. And late in his life, he was really fixated on the role that natural systems and feedback loops played in agricultural sustainability. And he had these early thoughts that um, maybe synthetic chemicals, the things that he had really focused his early career on were, were not um, really the, the, the panacea of, of long-term sustainability. And of course, there are other models out there that we can look to of these really, really long-term food systems. And one here that is remarkably close to home for us is the, the tradition of Camas meadow management in the Northwest. And Camas being this native wildflower with the edible bulb that along with salmon was a principal food source for native people here in the, in the region. Um, these, these systems were very thoughtfully managed through burning to create open clearings in the, in the forest. The, the bulbs were harvested at particular times of the year. And there's this saying, which I believe is uh, that, you know, with camas, the more you dig it, the better it does because you're, you're breaking off fragments of these bulbs and eventually you end up with something like this picture here on the right side, which is, it's, it's a food system for humans. But today, 
also in the Northwest, if I want to go find those rare pollinators that I talked about earlier, like the, the Taylor's checker spot butterfly, these are the same landscapes that I go to. So how is it that these food systems have been able to sustain people for thousands of years and also sustain biodiversity at the same time? I don't think that those two principles are, are separate. I think that they're intrinsically linked. And I think this is what, what Frank King was onto as well. We see a similar story with hedgerows in Western Europe. Hedgerows are an artifact in places like Normandy and the south of England that go back to Roman times. Um, and even further, they go all the way back into to early Bronze Age Europe, where you had farmers who were clearing forests to, to create agricultural plots. And they'd be digging in the soil, they'd pick up rocks out of their, their food plots, and they'd throw these rocks in rings around their, their cropland. And eventually the brambles would grow up into these rocks. And uh, then they learned that these brambles could serve as living fences to sustain, to, to contain livestock as well. And eventually these had become so well established that by the time Julius Caesar came along, they were being actively written about. And Caesar, in fact, himself wrote about these hedgerows in, um, in parts of France and what's now Belgium during his Gaelic uh, war enterprise, where he, he was stymied and his armies were stymied by the fact that the, the native people had constructed these woven living fences of thorny plants that his army couldn't make headway through. Um, if you go to Western Europe today, you'll see that the biomass over the centuries has accumulated and many of these ancient hedgerows are now on elevated embankments or burns. And it was only um, in the middle of the last century where these hedgerows were really famous at one point for the, the, the role that they played in the battle for Europe during the Second World War. And after D-Day, there are many accounts of Allied soldiers being bogged down in the, the countryside in Normandy, fighting the, the Germans on the other side of these same hedgerows. And these hedgerows were so thick and impenetrable that neither side could make strong headway through them. It wasn't until um, the an enlisted men in the US Army figured out that you could mount basically a giant saw on the front of a tank and cut through these hedgerows that, that strong progress came to be made. And it's fascinating to me that these hedgerows have sustained now multiple world wars. And yet, if you go visit them today, they're also the primary corridors for wildlife, whether those, whether we're talking about hedgehogs or foxes or rare songbirds or rare butterflies, these hedgerows are where it's at. And it's, it's remarkable that a, a ecological system can basically withstand apocalyptic conditions and come out the other side as a wildlife refuge. Uh, the last example here is um, one that I'm, I'm slightly more directly familiar with, which is the concept of Satoyama in Japan. And I went to college in Japan and lived in a Satoyama landscape. This, this is an agricultural model that is highly integrated between natural ecosystems and, and agriculture. Uh, Satoyama forests um, and much of the for many of the forests in Japan are actively managed for food production, both for mushroom production, for the harvesting of, of wood for incense, uh, for wild plants. And to do this, there's constant pruning that goes on in these forests. And with that constant pruning that goes on year after year for thousands of years, you end up with a lot of light penetration through the canopy and a really, really diverse understory plant community. And now in communities where you see people leaving the countryside and moving to 
the big city, you end up with these little ghost towns and the forests become darker and darker and more overgrown. And the biological diversity of those forests tends to decline. And if, similarly, if you move out of the forests and into the lowland areas, you end up with these rice paddy systems that um, are used as the primary spawning grounds for some fish. The native turtles do most of their feeding on slugs within these rice paddies, and actually turtles contribute a, a whole bunch to uh, pest management in these rice paddies. So you end up with this interesting model where without the rice production, suddenly you don't have places for the turtles to live, you don't have spawning grounds for the fish. Um, so again, it's this model of food production that sustains people over many, many, many thousands of years and supports nature at the same time. So all of that said, these are the, the underlying clues that we look for in doing our work. And these are the types of clues that you should be looking for too as you begin to adopt pollinator conservation ideas on, on your own uh, farm or your own garden. And that's what we're going to talk about now is how you, how you become one of those next farmers of 40 centuries. Um, and to do that, I'm going to really focus primarily on the role of native plants. Uh, if you look around us, we live in a, a landscape that has fragments of the original native plant ecosystem, um, but those plants, in the case of things like Doug fir or Western hemlock or alder, you know, those are like the, the crows or starlings or sparrows of the, the plant world. Those are the generalist plants that have been able to, to survive with, with human uh, density and occupation all around them. Um, but looking around us and looking at this photo here, this is a colleague's work of mine in Spain. Um, she recognized the fact that olives are plants of, of native savannas. So why not plant native savanna understories underneath them? And similarly, um, here looking at uh, the Central Valley of California, we thought about this this multi-thousand-year-old model of hedgerows and thought, well, why not plant hedgerows adjacent to these almond orchards? And this is work we initiated back in around 2004 and 2005 and began to use these native California shrubs and plant them out as linear uh, configurations around these fence lines in the Central Valley that had no other room to put natural habitat into them. As we started to do this, we were really interested in, you know, what happens when you plant a native shrub hedgerow in the middle of cent the Central Valley of California where there hasn't been any natural habitat for decades. And it turns out that one of the early observations was that these hedgerows were collecting and then distributing beneficial insects to the surrounding landscape. And this truly is the worst graph in the, the presentation here. So I apologize for that. But what this graph shows is that um, you can compare a farm that has a hedgerow in California and a farm that doesn't have a hedgerow. And you can raise the, the, the pests of that crop, like stink bug pests, and you can get them to lay eggs. You can put those eggs on yellow sticky cards and go position them 100 or 200 or 300 meters out into the middle of a crop field. And the farms that have hedgerows surrounding them actually have more of those pest eggs attacked by predatory wasps than what you see on farms that don't have those hedgerows. Meaning that those farms with the hedgerows are collecting uh, predatory wasps in the hedgerows, and then those wasps are spilling out to attack pests in the crop fields. And of course, we wanted to make sure that these hedgerows were not also attracting pests, and it turns out that they're not. And across the board, if you compare farms with hedgerows versus farms that don't, in the Central Valley, the, it turns out that there were 
fewer pests in and around these hedges and in the adjacent cropland than on farms that had just weedy field borders of, of non-native vegetation uh, around them. Which makes sense if you're planting ceanothus or coffee berry or a native rose in a hedgerow, those the insects that feed on those plants are different than the insects that are typically feeding on something like processing tomatoes or almonds. Um, we began to recognize that this kind of conservation also has other benefits. And we focused a lot increasingly on the value of interconnected habitat as climate corridors. This is a hedgerow planting with the Paradise Fire, which many of you probably remember from a few years ago outside Chico, California. Um, the, that is the actual fire raging in the background. And this is our team there planting this hedgerow next to an almond orchard in the foreground. Again, thinking about hedgerows surviving apocalyptic conditions, <clears throat> this, is, this is about as apocalyptic as you can get. And yet here, just a few days after this redbud tree was planted, we went out and, and the, the fire is still going. You can still see the smoke in the background. Here are the leaves of that plant already being used by a leaf cutter bee. Remember the leaf cutter bee from, from a while back? Um, these bees are already out there responding immediately to the, the introduction of these native plants. In, in these farms, which is amazing. And here is that same hedgerow uh, just a year later with the plants starting to mature. Eventually these, these, these shrubs and trees in here will get uh, 10 or 15 feet in height. We've taken this same idea and applied it at an incredible scale. This is an almond orchard in California. It looks like the surface of Mars with almond trees planted on a grid across it. You can see this irrigation ditch in the middle of it and all those tiny little dots on either side of the irrigation ditch are native shrubs, which have been planted into these massive uh, hedgerow corridor configurations across this orchard. And this is where I think conservation in agricultural lands is increasingly headed, is this idea of interconnected habitat across it. We do this um, work oftentimes looking out at kind of the satellite view scale. Here you can see a a uh, section of um, the California farm landscape. And you can sort of see here running from approximately a seven o'clock to a two o'clock position, um, the old uh, bed of a river that was a tributary to the San Francisco, or I'm sorry, the Sacramento River. And there, there it is um, illustrated that old river bed <clears throat> which has mostly been dried up and diverted. And here you see this massive gap in this otherwise natural corridor that wildlife would normally be using to move across the landscape. So it turns out we were working with farms around this spot, and this is what it looks like on the ground. This is an actual view of, of the adjacent tomato, organic tomato farm. Um, that occupies that former riverbed. There's, there's virtually nothing there in the way of pollinator habitat or wildlife habitat. So we worked with that farm to reintroduce a hedgerow corridor through that landscape and to begin to reconnect that, that formerly um, uh, lost natural uh, greenway through there. And there you can see the the start of that initial hedgerow there in the lower left hand side that is now now been expanded and is now uh, probably five, four or five feet in height. Um, and already blooming and again already attracting pollinators to it. We've applied the same model on uh, dry land farms in central Washington. Here's a 
head, a newly planted hedgerow adjacent to an apple orchard next to their irrigation reservoir. We've applied this model even in places where woody plants don't tend to do well, like the Northern Great Plains using, instead of shrubs, using uh, native prairie wildflowers to create these prairie strips that have all of these multiple benefits from uh, supporting pollinators and beneficial insects to reducing wind pressure on seedling crops to reducing water runoff from the fields. Uh, these, these habitat systems tend to support farms on multiple levels. Here's another prairie uh, strip on a farm in Minnesota, a vegetable farm in this case. Uh, we've even used native annual wildflowers in California as cover crops in these multi-thousand acre orchards down there with, with a strong degree of success with reseeding and having canopy and biomass levels that don't interfere with the harvesting of the crops. Um, we have collaborated with folks who are trying to integrate these native plant systems at uh, really, really interesting scales and levels. Like this is a vineyard outside Lyle, Washington in the Columbia Gorge that has essentially restored all of its land to a native wildflower savanna and then planted grape vines in the middle of that on trellises. Uh, there's another example of a habitat system. This one's a really different kind of habitat system called a beetle bank. Uh, if you remember the, the ground beetles that we talked about earlier, the most of those ground beetles are nocturnal animals and there are many predatory ground beetles, things that ground beetles that prey on slugs and snails. And those nocturnal ground beetles need thatchy, thatchy cover or grassy cover to hunker down in during the daytime. And these elevated rows of native prairie grasses, in this case, Indian grass and little blue stem and big blue stem provides that cover for the, the predatory beetles. Um, these folks, which are friends of ours, are using these beetle banks as their primary pest management system for their commercial vegetable crops, which is, is pretty, pretty remarkable. I talked about this farm earlier, this farm that's using these wildflower field borders as a source of pollinators for their blueberry crops. I thought I would just show you what this field border looks like. This is the same year, I believe this is 2014. Um, the photo on the left-hand side is what that field border looks like in May, and on the right side is what it looks like in early July. So you get this cascade of wildflowers throughout the growing season. Again, in California, another example of these flowering field borders, a barren area here next to a, an irrigation reservoir, uh, which we planted with native wildflowers. We have seen this kind of work done on dairy farms, uh, for endangered butterflies in the Midwest, on grazing lands in, in parts of the Midwest and Great Plains, mimicking the grazing patterns of bison on native prairie plants. And you can get uh, just about as geeky with this notion as you want. This is actually my farm on Whidbey. This is a, a cider orchard planted entirely on the native Malus fusca, the Pacific crab apple rootstock. So uh, at, as more and more of this gets um, converted to native vegetation, it will eventually be the system that is entirely a native plant community at the soil level and below with, with an apple crop um, over the top of it. But you can also integrate native plants into home gardens and mix and match them with things like lavender and non-native plants. Uh, many of our native plants, and I'll show you some examples here, are really showy and work really well as ornamental plants. Native plants can be integrated into things like bioswales to um, clean uh, stormwater runoff and provide habitat for pollinators at the same time. This is a uh, showy milkweed bioswale in Portland 
There are land trusts that are using their land base as basically pollinator reserves, planting native wildflowers on them, restoring them to native flowering habitats um, to conserve green space for communities and at the same time increasing the biological value of those green spaces. Uh, this is an example of another native plant restoration project at Portland Airport. Uh, this is a 50 acre meadow restoration project that my team did on an island in the Columbia River where we actually had to move tractors on barges to get over there and convert this weedy area covered by tall fescue and um, Canada thistle back to a native plant community. So you can do this in a whole bunch of different places. So in the time we have left here, let's really focus on how you do this in your own space. And at a, a macro level, when you're doing native plant restoration, you typically the, the types of plant materials you're using informs the process to some degree. So you're either using transplants or seed to, to restore native plant habitat. Each has their pros and cons. Transplants are faster to establish. They're better for woody plants and shrubs and creating things like hedgerows, but they're also more expensive. Um, that said, they can be a little more forgiving and a little more competitive with weeds. Seeding is um, usually cheaper, and so it's uh, oftentimes a better option for large planting areas, but it tends to require more thorough site preparation. And it can take a little longer to get all of the existing vegetation cleaned out of an area to do that. Just walking you through some of the, the basic um, common sense stuff here. If you are using transplants to do things like plant hedgerows, you want to make sure that you can irrigate them, especially in the summertime. Uh, fall planting is really good because it gives the, the plants some time during the rainy season to set down roots. Um, in the northwest here, I really encourage people to focus on very narrow hedgerows because as all of you know we get blackberries everywhere and you want to have a hedgerow that you can go in and extract blackberry canes from before they take over your native shrubs. And then remember to protect um, those plants from, from things like deer or rabbits that might damage them. Uh, hedgerows do require management. Uh, I mentioned blackberries. So if you're planting a hedgerow or planting woody plants, you want to plan for that. You may also want to plan for shrubs periodically dying off and needing replacements. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, you may also want to plan for things like rose or snowberry or, or Oregon grapes suckering out from underneath your a hedgerow planting, so having a brush mower factored into the future of the management of that hedgerow may be important. And also keep in mind that some things that you may plant as shrubs, like some of our native willows, may balloon into huge trees. So uh, pruning may be also something that you want to plan for. The summary here is that you can't simply plant something like a hedgerow without factoring in the need that it will have for long-term management. Um, and many of the principles apply also to, to using wildflowers as transplants. For those of you who are vegetable producers, I will point out that there's a bit of a history now with vegetable producers who are adopting this idea and using their vegetable transplanter to go out and plant um, plugs of native wildflowers in rows, which is a convenient way to do it in, in a setting adjacent to a, a row crop area. And here you can see a few examples of it. And these can grow up into really beautiful plantings. Direct seeding in contrast requires really clean site work to begin with. Sites that are clean of, of existing vegetation, sites that have been depleted of their dormant weed seed bank. And an old field in the Northwest 
keep in mind, it may have hundreds of pounds of dormant weed seed per acre in the ground in an old pasture here. So you can't simply scrape the sod off and expect it to be weed free. We use a range of different site preparation methods. Herbicides are one of those tools. People don't oftentimes like to hear that. Um, but we also work a lot with organic farms who need to use non-chemical options. And one of those that I'll mention here is solarization, the use of, hot, of clear greenhouse plastic with the edges buried to bake um, literally use the sun's energy over the course of the summer to bake the, the not only the existing vegetation, but the weed seed in the soil several inches down and create a sort of sterilized seed bed. And this is the kind of result that you can get from solarization. The results can be really beautiful. Here's another example. This is a site that was cultivated in May 2013. To, to just create a clean planting bed. We immediately put on the clear greenhouse plastic with the edges buried in uh, June of that year. In October, we pulled the plastic off and directly overseeded the site and just sowed wildflower seed directly on the soil surface. The following year, one year later, you already see the seed blush and the nemophila and several other things blooming in there. And then look, just a, uh, a month after that, we had already a massive growth of, of uh, summer farewell to spring or Clarkia flowering in that site. Um, you can apply the solarization idea at a really large scale. This is uh, the friends of ours in, um, in Wisconsin who solarized a very, very large planting area with clear greenhouse plastic. And what they did is they simply solarized one area and they left one edge buried and then they flipped it over like a pancake. Uh, and then that, this way they're moving that plastic across the field year after year. You can see them out there broadcasting the seed on the site. And this is what it looks like. Um, just a, a couple of years later, the area on the left was the first one that the first area that was solarized and then seeded. And now the next area there that says year one, those are all wildflowers that haven't yet started to bloom. They're not mature enough, but they're moving this whole habitat area across the entire crop field. So again, key points, the edges of the plastic get buried. Um, I don't recommend using tractors, but some people do this. Um, it's good to have a lot of help because plastic is hugely heavy um, and it, it's quite cumbersome if you're going to try to do this. We see people get uh, sort of ingenious with their approaches to, to moving big sheets of plastic and we don't recommend doing this on windy days because I speak from experience, you, you will become airborne um, in, in cases like that. Um, plastic does get holes in it. Yeah, you can get uh, greenhouse tape to patch those holes. Um, and then, I mean, to be honest and to be clear, plastic creates a huge amount of gross waste. Um, and I personally am pretty turned off by plastic. Um, and yet, you know, the farmers who are doing this, we really encourage them to reuse that plastic again and again and again, and basically run it until the wheels fall off. And you can oftentimes get five, six years out of a, a quality sheet of plastic and create massive areas of habitat. Um, and I'm gonna move on to this particular slide because alternatively, you can have success with black plastic as well. But you usually need to leave it on for a full year to really deplete the weed seed bank underneath it, uh, especially in our climate. Whereas solarization is fast, but it requires a lot of precision. You got to make sure there's no holes to let the hot air out of it. Black plastic is more forgiving. The edges don't need to be fully buried, but it does take longer. And if you want to do this on a small scale, um, I encourage you to visit your local lumber yard because they'll give you the lumber wrap 
for free and you can use that on, on smaller scale projects. Uh, in the time we have left here, I'll just talk a little bit here about how we formulate seed mixes for direct seeding projects. We are usually aiming for 40 to 60 seeds per square foot. The more diversity you can include in a pollinator seed mix, the better. It's good to include some bunch grasses, the native bunch grasses, things like Romer's fescue or tufted hair grass will help crowd out the weedy grasses. We usually include some annual wildflowers to have blooming plants the first, uh, the first season or so. And then you see this bullet here on reference sites. You can ignore that. It basically means don't expect your planting to look like you know, someone else's plant. And don't expect it to look like uh, a native wildflower glamour shot that you see on Flickr or something. Your, your landscape, your soils, your seed mix will ultimately decide what kind of plant community it wants to be. You can do seeding by hand. I prefer to do seeding by hand, by hand scattering the seed like chicken feed. You can use belly broadcasters. There's heavier equipment for larger sites. Uh, but I really encourage you to, if you're working on a, a small scale, less than five acres, to really consider doing it by hand. And it's not hard to do that. We, um, we have people take their seed mix and usually bulk it up or increase the volume with something like cat litter or sand or vermiculite, and then to distribute that mixture into multiple buckets and then to walk back and forth multiple times in overlapping uh, pathways across a planting area to fully cover a site. And if you've got people walking perpendicular to each other, back and forth across a field with buckets of seed and sand mixed up, you get a very good overlap and a very good, very even distribution. And it's oftentimes just much easier to do this than to try to calibrate a, a, a seeder, a mechanical seeder to do this. Um, things to watch out for in wildflower meadows would be things like woody plant invasion by blackberry. So you'll want to have a plan to mow most wildflower meadows every couple of years at a minimum. These are never weed free either. So you'll want to be out there looking for things like the Canada thistle or the tansy and being active in your weed management, especially early on. Um, sometimes the diversity of wildflowers will decline, so you may want to think about overseeding a site periodically. And then um, I also encourage you to, you know, sometimes consider plowing something up and starting again if it didn't meet expectations or if it was neglected. Um, last thoughts here. Um, you know, remember, there are these three functional groups of pollinators. They can be active at different times of the year, so they need plants blooming at different times of the year. They need things like willows and maples early on. They need things like the, the Oregon sunshine, which are going to bloom later, the goldenrods and asters that are going to bloom in the fall. And thinking back to that model of the camas meadow tradition in our our region, I mentioned that if you, I want to go find Taylor's checker spot butterflies, I tend to look in those places. We don't have, because it's a cool, wet climate, we don't have a huge amount of insect diversity in the Northwest. But these meadows and these camas meadow type models are a really good template for the ideal insect or ideal pollinator habitat. Pollinators like open, sunny, wildflower rich habitats. And that's what our target should be if we're trying to create habitat for them. The plants of these communities, of course, beyond the camas are also things like lupins and self heal and goldenrods and uh, fire weeds and gum weeds and our native clovers. <clears throat> And I'll show you here in a moment where to get some sources for that, for those, uh, for those plant lists. For hedgerows, again, we've got things like Oregon grape and our Nootka rose and snowberry. Uh, we've got a massive range of different native shrubs here that we can work with. And last thought here is that many of these um, 
non-native plants that we see around us, things like blackberry that we don't like, or things like lavender, which we do like, don't tend to support the, the native bees as much as they support non-native bees like honeybees. So if you want to make a difference for these rare and declining and at-risk native insects, native plants are the way to do that. So to conclude here, we've covered a lot of ground. Everything that I've talked about here is summarized somewhere in a Xerces publication. All of the, the major Xerces publications are available as free downloads on our website, including lists of those native wildflowers and native shrubs. And we have things like pollinator habitat assessment guides, which are basically scorecards that help you look at your landscape through a pollinator's lens and identify where there may be missing habitat features for them. We have guides to installing wildflowers, including non-chemical guides to or non-herbicide guides to doing that. So check us out at xerces.org. And then lastly here again, your conservation districts are an invaluable source of technical support for native plant restoration and conservation work. So I wanna thank again, uh, Kitsap Conservation District and Jefferson County Conservation District. Uh, please reach out to those folks and uh, let them know if you're interested in, in supporting this kind of conservation work on your own land. And they can be a great source of information and resources to help get you on, on the right track. Um, again, Xerces.org for all of our resources. And thank you for that. Uh, I've got a few moments here left. Liz, do you have? questions that we should be looking at. Yeah, thank you, Eric. That was fabulous as always. Um, one question specific to solarization. Can you clarify again what thickness of plastic folks should use? Yeah, um, we usually recommend if you're going to use that solarization to use six mil or greater plastic, so really heavy duty high tunnel greenhouse plastic. Thinner plastic tends not to hold up and then you just end up creating a lot of waste um, as it rips and shreds and blows away. Um, so stick with, with thicker plastic and again, plan on reusing it again and again and again. A good source of this is if you know folks who have a greenhouse who are periodically replacing plastic, uh, it's a good way to recycle it and keep it out of the waste stream for a while. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. Um, a specific question here. What do you recommend as information sources to know which native flowers would work for pollinators in any region? Um, and I just want to let everybody know that Xerces has some great um, pollinator plant lists. And the best way to find those, I think, is to just go to Google or any search engine and type in Xerces pollinator plants. Um, and the first hit should link to that on our page. Um, and with that, we are just about wrapping up. So I want to say thank you again to everyone for joining us and sticking with us. Um, and thank you, Eric, for that wonderful presentation. And thank you, Sharon and Diane, for helping us bring this course together. Um, and just one more time, I'll let everybody know my email um, is listed in the follow up. Um, and you can send any further questions to me and I'll connect you to our staff. Um, and lastly, there's going to be a link in the follow up email that you'll receive and any residents of Jefferson and Kitsap counties, um, you're eligible to receive a copy of our book, Attracting Native Pollinators. So the, there will be a link to a Google form that you can fill out um, to request a book. And with that, I think we're all set. Any last thoughts, Eric? No, thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone joining us and stay safe and stay healthy.